Here at Sebring, we finally got a chance to do something we've been working on for a little while. Uh, we got to go up in the new CTLSI from Flight Design. It's a great little airplane. You know it's great in a couple of ways, not just because I say so for sure, but because more people have bought one of these light sport aircraft than any other single model in the market. Uh, there's some other big companies that have done quite well at this, and we're glad for all of their success, but here's your market leader. Um, and there's a good reason why. It's a good performing airplane that zips through the sky quite nicely. It's got a big comfortable interior and as you can tell by the large amount of glassed in area here, plastic area, you can see the world out of this airplane. So a lot like flying a helicopter I'm told by people that have that experience. So there's a lot to be said about this airplane here and we'll try and sum it up a little bit. First of all, let's talk about construction. With the exception of a few steel parts here and there on the airplane, this is a 98% carbon fiber aircraft. They were one of the first to really get in and promote that hard. And this airplane, I flew it first in France, looking somewhat different, quite a bit different actually than it does today, in about 95. So this airplane has been around for more than 20 years and there's close to 2,000 of them flying around the world. It's not only been a success story here in the United States, but in many other countries. Um, and one of the reasons why is, is, is the shape, but this has kind of an egg shape to it, which if you talk to aeronautical engineers that really know their stuff, they'll tell you this is one of the soundest shapes for a device, for an object to slip through the air efficiently. And this one does that very well. You notice there's no strut here. This is a cantilevered wing, meaning there's no, no all the support is built inside the structure. And throughout, it's a sleek, smooth product that has gone through some changes that have made it an even better airplane as it's done so. So among those changes I referenced is, you can't really tell it from here, but the earliest versions that came in, it was called CT2K, that was for 2000, so that how you know how far back that goes, uh, nearly 20 years now. That was followed by something called the CTSW, and the reason why is because the older model had longer wings on it, had almost a 20 to 1 glide, and for people that aren't used to that kind of glide, they found the airplane hard to get on the ground. That sounds like a problem you shouldn't worry about too much. We want to be up in the air, not on the ground, but when it is time to land, some people were a little challenged by that. So they came out with the CTSW, which stood for short wing, and which has about the wingspan that this one has on it. That suited American experience better. Not American taste so much, but a lot of folks have learned how to fly in Cessnas and Pipers, and this was the current edition was just closer to that. But the one thing you can't really tell very well is that when it went from SW to CTLSI or CTLS, uh, the I came later with the fuel injected engine. That's what that uh, extra letter is for. But they extended the fuselage back another 14 inches. Now, you may not be an engineer like I'm not an engineer, but think about what that takes. You don't just sort of stick on some extra stuff. You've got a whole process of engineering to do that and the tail structure has to change and accommodate that. But by moving that further aft, they were able to extend the fuselage a little bit and one of the additions that came with the CTLS is this addition of a window back here and a little space back there, sometimes called a hat rack. Uh, that also made the cabin environment a little nicer. The bulkhead used to be right behind the rear seats and it felt a little more compact in there for some people. But mainly when they pushed that back, it gave the aircraft some enhanced stability, uh, which again suits an American uh, experience because uh, American designed airplanes, the legacy airplanes I just mentioned, Cessna, Piper, so on, uh, all had a similar shape to them that this now has. That made it a much more acceptable product for many American pilots, but it worked well all around the world. Why didn't they do that earlier? Because they were trying to meet European standards for ultralights in Europe. That's not like our ultralights, but uh, they're almost the same as this, but they're quite a bit lighter in weight, 450 kilos versus 600. So that gives you some numerical values to put together. And in order to keep it within the tighter constraints of the European ultralight definition, they had, to, they had to limit weight everywhere they could. And European pilots are significantly trained in how to fly. Uh, their beginning flights are often in sailplanes, which have some different control characteristics. So when they moved to the older version of the CT, most of those pilots had no trouble. When it came over here to the U.S. and became quite a hit, uh, they needed to Americanize it, if you will, and this is the Americanized version.
So a beautiful construction. Almost doesn't look like there's enough room for a 912 in here. That's because some of it actually goes back into the instrument panel a little bit, or what you think is the instrument panel. But the result is that this is an airplane that puts the pilot way up front where you've got, as I said, terrific visibility. And inside the aircraft, uh, you've got uh, what as at the time was a ground setting cabin width. I believe the number here is 49 and a half inches. And just to put that in perspective, that's more than 10 inches wider than a Cessna 172 that almost everybody's been in. It's several inches wider than even the larger Cessna 182. So this is a roomy aircraft inside with some beautiful seating in there. Uh, they often are delivered with leather seats. They have uh, lumbar support that you can adjust with a squeeze bulb and whatnot. Uh, and uh, the, the airplane is just a comfortable airplane to be in for a long time. And you can be in it for a long time because this one carries 35 gallons of fuel on board, uses that 912 fuel injected engine that only burns about four gallons. So you can begin to get the numbers for yourself, but it has a, a range in statute miles of nearly a thousand miles. And I always used to say, I, I can't stay in an airplane that long. I don't need an airplane to be in the air that long. Why go that far? Why have that many gallons on board? Well, first of all, you don't have to fill it up with gas every time you go fly then. You can measure that and know how much you've got and go fly for several hours and come back and land and do all that with half tanks, actually. But I had a flight to the Bahamas a while back, a few years ago, in one of these airplanes that somebody kindly loaned to me and flew all around the Bahamas and came back to the USA, never bought any gas anywhere else. So the gas I had, I knew the quality of it when I left. I never had to refuel. It got all the way back to the original starting point and then finally put some more fuel in it. And then I went, ah, now I begin to get one of the values of having all that fuel on board. So there's a good example about that. I want to close this door again here and show you something about this particular airplane. You may be able to see this extra inset here. This is what's called a photo window and it's an option on the airplane. And that slides up and gives you this opening right here without any canopy around to interfere with your camera. Uh, when you're taking pictures. Now, you, I've shot plenty of pictures through these windows, and it actually looks pretty good, but you often get a little reflection. Here's a way to eliminate that. It's just one of the many options that you can get on this airplane. It's delivered quite complete, however, and one example of that is its parachute, which you can't see any part of. It's all buried in the fuselage. It's all executed, and it's a BRS system, and they've worked with the BRS engineering uh, engineers to make sure that everything is just right about that. They tested it. It works well. It's been used well one or two times, I think, in the CT uh, because of other issues. But uh, it's a successful product, and it has this airplane. Every single one that's come into the United States has a ballistic parachute on it, an airframe parachute on it, as standard equipment. They've all used the Rotax engine, have, and I'm sure will continue for the indefinite future. And the engine produces. Uh, top of the category speeds, you can go about 120 knots in this aircraft with the engine cranked up pretty good. Uh, typical cruise in the airplane is 110 to 115 knots at more modest uh, fuel consumption. But you can get, the, I've seen fuel consumption in this over a long flight of below four gallons an hour. So this sleekness and smoothness that you see works very well. Control systems, conventional controls, rudder pedals. It does that use as a center handbrake, which is down in the center console right near the throttle. Um, it does not have a differential steering, but the uh, nose wheel steering is very good on the airplane, and my experience with it has never been, I never felt trapped on any ramps or anything. I was able to do all the steering I needed to do very well. Um, both sides, uh, dual controls on both sides. It has uh, elevator trim, which virtually every airplane has these days, but it also has rudder trim and it has aileron trim. So you can set this up any way you want uh, in flight to adjust for conditions or loading or whatnot. Uh, it now has, uh, you can see perhaps in the back there, it's got a fuel selector valve on the, on the rear bulkhead. It's uh, uh, not as convenient to reach as one right here, but it's easily reached and it's not in your way and nobody's going to bump it. So that allows you to shift fuel back and forth. You've got a sight gauge inside the uh, wing root up there. You can kind of see a little label on the back side there to tell you just how much gallons you've got on board. So it's very easy to monitor those kinds of things. The flight design has always been, uh, virtually since the beginning, since these instruments first came out anyway, used either Dynon or Garmin equipment and great big panels on the screens. And they were one of the first to embrace autopilot as well. So if you're um, 
into flying long distance, uh, uh, the autopilot's a nice feature. When I first started having some experience in one of these airplanes, I went, well, I don't want autopilot. I like hand flying the airplane. That's some of the joy. But if you're going on a cross-country flight, and especially if you're doing that solo, you know, you can't hardly beat autopilot, and that used to be a terribly expensive option on type-certified aircraft. On these airplanes, it really doesn't add that much, and it's a nice feature. Uh, so it's got all the, all the modern features inside. Uh, comfort is good. Visibility is good. Uh, uh, great big people can fit in this airplane easily. Uh, back here, I'll close the doors and show you. There is a uh, baggage door right here I'm describing with my hand, and there's one on the other side as well. And they can hold uh, weight and balance, of course, has to be considered. But it's possible to put 55 pounds of luggage back there. And the only thing I ever had to do was figure out the right kind of bags to put my stuff in that would fit through that opening. And then you can carry pretty much anything you want. There's also some little places inside where you can stash some things that you might want in flight because you can't get at those things in the luggage area while in flight. So uh, before we come back out and, and deal a little bit with the whole airplane, I want to talk about the particular system that's in this airplane. This has the new Dynon setup, which is called HDX. And the HDX is a, yet another improvement in the very popular Dynon Skyview uh, digital instrument that's in here. Now, Skyview has that name because it literally gives you what's called synthetic vision, meaning that if you can't see because of clouds or fog or obstacles or whatever, that screen in there using digital uh, uh, database will, will create what you're actually seeing, even though you may not be able to see it. That's not to say you should be flying in those kind of conditions, but you know what? If a, if a fog rolls in just when you're on landing approach and it can't happen that quickly sometimes, this device is going to help you out. They've now taken that uh, Skyview system just one notch further, and this is the HDX model I just referred to. It's a new uh, bezel, that is the, the outer construction of the instrument itself, which protrudes from the panel just a little bit. You might think, well, why wouldn't they flush mount it? Well, there's a reason why, and that's because a touch screen instrument like this means literally you got to touch the screen and if you're kind of bouncing along in turbulence it can be hard to hit the one point on the screen that you want so you typically will anchor your fingers on some part of that bezel and then can use your thumb or another finger to reach that while you're even moving now in the HDX model there's a lower panel down here which has which angled toward you and the it has physical hard buttons on that which buttons change depending on what you're seeing, and they're labeled, and the labels change when you go to a different screen uh, view. Uh, but that is a nice improvement on this airplane, and it works very, very slick. Dynon has been one of the leaders in the uh, modern instrumentation development. Uh, they're a company that uh, virtually every airplane out here uh, if, if they at least offer Dynon, they may not have it exclusively because there are a couple of other good choices from Garmin and MGL and, and companies like that. Uh, but Dynon, I'm sure, is the dominant one out here. If I looked in every airplane out here, I'd see that company more than any others, and the HDX is their newest model. So uh, this is one of the uh, companies that uh, they've been a leader in so many ways, and here's another one. The ADSB requirement, this thing that's coming at us like a freight train for 2020, FAA is requiring airplanes to have this. It's a system that helps everybody know where everybody else is in the sky. That seems good, but it requires some extra hardware and some accommodation. And this company jumped in front of that just about as soon as anyone did and came out with a ADSB 2020 product earlier than almost anybody else in the business. So you, this airplane, the one you see right here, has all that requirement already out of the way. You buy the airplane, you're, you're done. You don't have to go add anything. You don't have to seek out extra parts or spend extra money on it. This is an ADS-B system ready to go right now. So now, coming back outside the airplane again, this one has some large tires on it. You may not be able to tell, but this is uh, quite a wide wheel pant. And so these are what uh, might be called Tundra tires, but they're nicely fared in, so you're not paying a speed penalty or not very much of a speed penalty to have those on there. But if you took those off, you can also get floats for this. It has been approved for amphibious floats. Um, and matter of fact, that trip I took to the Bahamas I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the other pilots from one of their big distributors, Airtime uh, Aviation in Oklahoma, uh, their pilot was flying one on amphibious floats and got to land out there in the ocean. Pretty cool. So the last thing I want to say about this company is that Flight Design USA, which has been the importer for many years, 
uh, has built quite an extensive array of uh, dealers and service centers and of all the airplanes in the LSA fleet, this uh, flight design CTLS is probably, and CTLSI is probably one of the best supported in the business. So that's a lot of information about flight design. I hope that's been useful, but there's always more questions you have, and we want to direct you to their website, which is flightdesign.com or flightdesignusa.com, and you can get lots more information about this airplane. I've got plenty of reviews, and we've done a number of videos about them. You can find that and information about all kinds of other airplanes in the affordable aircraft range on bydanjohnson.com.